Don't try to sneak into your room like that. I know what you've got behind your back. Records. More no records. Okay, behind this door, this nondescript door in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, is Paul Gold's Salt Mastering. And we are going to enter and check out. And there Hello. he is, Mr. Paul Gold. We've never met before. No, we've it's never a met pleasure before. To meet you. Yeah. Shake your hand. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. And so uh, I'm here because you had sent me, you had reached out to me uh, in an email that you had s installed a whole new board that you built here from from the beginning. I don't from like to use the word S C R A T C H in front of records. Okay. And so let, let's start in there with the board, okay. and then we'll Great. then we'll work our way out. So yes, I built, um, this took me approximately 15 years to build. Whoa! <laughs> um, it, it was done, um, and the, the, it, um, it's called Shaker Desk, and the concept behind it is that it, it's what's called an A-B path console. And what that means is that um, the, the console has two identical halves. If you look, this hat, this part looks the same as this part, and you can see there's a line here. This belongs to this. This belongs to this. And, and the, what, what is that? What's the benefit of that? The purpose of the A B path console is for mastering directly from open reel tape to the lacquer master record without um, going into the computer. Oh. And and. Um, the uh, the 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 reason you need to do that is that a record is cut all at once. It's cut as a single spiral from the outside diameter right. to the inside diameter. You can't edit as you do it. Yes, we know. So so if you have um, say your your side A sequenced on on tape, um, and you want different settings for each song as you're mastering. The only way to do different settings is either to scramble during the time in have, between have three, songs. Three people here. Yeah, or, so, okay. you know, making yourself crazy. Well, we're all and crazy. Yes, so well, that's not a problem. Um, yes. Yes, that <laughs> is. Um, or, <clears throat> or you have to have a setup like this, um, where you have two separate sets of controls. Now, I'm not the first one to think of an A-B path console. So, um, you could have the, the, the next track set up on that one and just flip it back and then exactly. get this one set up for the next track and go back and forth. Exactly. Oh, that's cool. So, what you would do is you would, um, well, I don't, I, we could turn on the tape machine and put up a tape, I guess. Um, what's this? Um, let's see, I didn't really have... It's ready to go, but um, uh, I think we'll get we we'll get the gist of it. You get the gist of it. Uh, well, we, why don't you do this tape machine? So you have two studers with preview heads. Uh, I actually have three, three studers with preview heads. If you'd like to, how dare I peruse over here? Three. Um, it's uh, you know it's a little tight in here. But it's I, fun. What, what, what area is this from? Uh, this is from the early 70s. It's an extremely rare deck. It's the only one I've ever seen. Um, and uh, it, it's actually called a... Was It was sold by Neumann as an oh. MT-72. Huh. Um, but it is a Telefunken M15, not 15A, just 15, so it's the all-discreet one. Um, so this doesn't have a preview head, so you... Yes, just, it does. It does? Yes. Um, it works in a different way. You, you, load, the, you, you load the tape here... And that's the preview head. Oh, that's the playback head. So you load you load the tape there, and then you pull the tape, and you can see that just, that's for seven and a half ips thirty three, seven and a half ips forty five, fifteen ips forty five, and I've fifteen. I've been in a lot of mastering places. I've never seen that ever. <laughs> that's so yeah, cool. this is that. Uh, it's the only way. It's the way Telefunken did it, or AEG, who was the yeah. manufacturer. But yeah, I've never seen it on another deck. How does it sound? Is this a good sounding machine? Fantastic. Wow. It, 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 absolutely fantastic. Um, fantastic. Um, but it's touchy. Um, 
like if if you have a tape that's even a little bit sticky it doesn't really work very well if you have a tape that isn't slit very well it doesn't work very well yeah. so it's it sounds fantastic but it, it doesn't work in all situations so do you try it first on this because it sounds so good and then if it doesn't work out go to one of the one of the more mundane machines yes and no um um you know, there are some niceties that are, you know, it has this manual counter. So if I have a, first of all, this deck is seven and a half ips and 15 ips. So if it's a seven and a half ips tape and I have to cut from it, it's this deck and this deck only. Yeah, because right? that's the, the only 15 one I have. 30? Right. Yeah. Um, but for 15 ips, this is generally my first choice, except if it's going to be sort of practically difficult to do it. If there are a lot of moves and I really have to be accurate at yeah. the time, I yeah. can't really rely on this yeah. time counter to do it. But the sound is absolutely fantastic. But this is the only one inch preview deck ever made. Oh, it's a closet case. Yeah, it doesn't problems. get used very much because not too many people use one inch <laughs> two track tape. But um, yeah, this this machine I had put together by um, John French and uh, Dan Zellman. Dan Zellman did the mechanical part, and John French made the head stack and put that together. How long have you had this here? Um, almost ten years now. Mm. Yeah, it's hardly ever been used. Um, if pe people know about this, or people don't know about it, well, now they'll know about <laughs> it. Hopefully, they they'll know. know about they should it. know about it. I'm pretty proud of it. I'm, you know, sort of bum that it doesn't get used more often. Well, we'll see if we can do something about that. Yeah. And then below there you have a... Uh, it's an Otari MX5050. I use that for any sort of quarter track or three and three quarters mm. uh, tapes I so get in that I have to use. We're equipped here with a lot of interesting, unique stuff. Yeah. And now you got that board going in. It, yeah. So you fired it up for the first time after how, after 15 years? No, it was done in, it was done in, um, in sort of sections um but you could you could could you use it in sections or yes you could um you know the uh, what it replaced was a um a, a neumann sp75 console okay. which was also a an ab path console but the ab path consoles that neumann made were very limited in facilities um you'd have you know you have kind of the neum two sets of the neumann cassette eqs um, two sets of level adjusters, but everything else was shared. So it was, you know, it, it wasn't, it, it's not really um, very flexible for a modern mastering setup. And everything in here is old school, discrete, electronic? No. no it's nope. I use a lot of IC op amps. I, that's, that's fine. Yeah, I like IC op amps. Um, and I'm not a circuit designer, so I'm sort of uh, tied to, you know, um, whatever I can uh, scrounge up circuit wise. Um, and your speakers are uh, ATCs, ATCs uh, 100s, 100As. Standard. Yeah. So yeah, I was always saying it was built in stages. The first, the the first thing I did was build the the monitor section, um, which is uh, um, which is a pretty unique design. I can't pull it out now, but it's That's a. Fine. The monitor system is completely passive, so the only thing between, so if you select the, you know, the, the tape machine, you can monitor directly off the tape machine, and the only thing between the tape machine and the speakers are five resistors. Wow, that's um, great. Yeah. It's, um, it's, a, it's what's called an H-pad, a full H-pad. They're, um, they're bridged H-pads and full H-pads. This is a full H-pad, which allow. And what that allows is um, I have a 10K input impedance and a 5K output impedance. Um, so that, um, so that integrate, um, integrates pretty well into the, the board and there are no level shifts when, when uh, you, you switch around because I have a, a high... A so high when you got it all working and you, and you used it for the first time and working, completely working, was it great? Was it great? Well, it... It happens so slowly. Yeah. I mean, so the first there thing... There wasn't like a, a moment. No, no, uh, oh, no, no. You no. can say there was, and we'll, um, tell, we'll make believe and tell people it was a moment. But okay. Genius. I'm a genius. <laughs> there you go. That's what I was waiting for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, the first thing to get done was the monitor section. And then the second part to get done was what I call the transfer path. So I separated into transfer path and processing path. So the transfer path... If, if I'm um, 
cutting from files or, or cutting on an already mastered tape and we don't need any EQs, any processing or anything. Um, there's the input amplifier. So this is source select. So I would source select whatever I want. The DAW, tape mesh, that A80, that A80, and there are two uh, auxiliary positions. Um, and then this is the input amplifier, so it's plus and minus 11 dB in half dB steps. I use the, um, this, uh, this is the only commercial product in the console, the Masselec high frequency limiters. I have one on each side. Um, and where, where does it limit it at? 15K roll up or something? Uh, no, it doesn't really work that way. The, okay. um, the, 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 fa the, the faster the envelope and the higher the frequency, the more limiting. Okay. Um, um, so, and that replaces the high frequency limiter in the cutting rack, which I don't use. Okay. Um, so, so there's the input amplifier, and then there's the, um, uh, the filter, filter sections. Um, this was the first one to go in, um, just 40 hertz and 16K. Um, and this is the elliptical EQ, which commonly is called summing to mono, but it's not, that's kind of a little bit of a misnomer. Okay. Um, and then the, and then I have more filter frequencies that I installed pretty recently along with a um, stereo image adjuster, wider, narrower. Um, <coughs> so it goes from here through the, the filters and the elliptical EQ, um, if they're used. And you bypass them though. Oh yeah, yeah, in, yeah. out. Um, and uh, this is the uh, output amplifier for the A section. Um, this is the output amplifier for the B section. Okay. And the A and the B output amplifiers feed the A B switch. So, so if you have song one and you're playing song one, you'd adjust the. Um, well, assuming. Uh, so you go through it and you make you make notations about what each song needs, and you can. Yes. While the second one, is, as long as it's not a really short song, you're good. Yeah. Here, let me show you, um, like the notes from an analog session. There you go. Are there fewer and fewer of those, or you get, or do you find your? No. Um, I. I mean, that's why I built the thing. Yeah. Um, right. And uh, no, I get a, a fair, a fair amount of them. So, like for this one. You know, the typical notes are, I, I put up the tape. This tape didn't have calibration tones on it, so I had to take the tones off the, uh, off the MRL tape. I, I talked to the engineer, and, you know, he told me what he did, and yeah. I thought it was going to work, so did that. And then, you know, this is, the, this is my, um, this was just an EP, two songs on a side. Right. So, you know, this is the, the settings for that side. This is the settings for that side with the, with the times and everything. Cool. Okay, so now it comes out of there and it goes into the, is it right into the lathe? So yes. And you've yeah. got, you got Dolby, Dolby there on your knee? Um, yeah, Dolby, I have, uh, can, do, can do it two ways. Can do A and SR both in the 363 frames and the 361 frames. Um, <coughs> this is the VG66 um, uh, lathe amplifier package. It's the uh, Neumann had three generations of uh, lathe electronics. The early tube VG1, which right. nobody ever uses. Um, this VG66 and the later SAL74. Um, I, I, I've always used this. I like it. Um, I, uh, I, I prefer it. <laughs> so okay. that's what I use. And uh, yeah, and that's the that's the so, VMS sixty six. So this, this is a VMS sixty sixty six. Wow. Um, the VMS sixty six and the VMS seventy are functionally identical. Um, in other words, uh, pretty much any part of either one can be used on the other ones. I mean, there are some very very minor differences, yeah. like a transformer that's located on the frame here on the 66 is located here in the 70. Big but, difference. Big but, difference. You know, okay. but really not not much of a difference. Right. Um, uh, How long have you had this lathe? I've had this lathe for about 17 or 18 years oh. now, um, and uh, it's a very very early one. Um, I, I think it's almost a prototype. Um, now, where did you buy this from? Gotham Audio or? Uh, 
No. Um, I. <clears throat> um, you don't have to answer the question if you don't want to. No. This well, is not an interrogation. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> I'll answer the question, um, um, but I'll circle back a little bit. Um, the the first lathe I bought was a VMS sixty two special. And um, I knew nothing about lathes. I'd never seen one in person, and I just decided to do it. Wow. So I got it, and of course it didn't really work. And, <laughs> um, and uh, eventually, after about six months of really trying to get it to work, um, I, I got it functional, and I was able to cut a little bit, but I knew it wasn't really right. Yeah. No, I, um, that's how I met Al Grundy, who was oh. um, the uh, sort of the the lathe guru of the eastern United I've heard States. That name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I spent about 10 years with with Al, um, Al uh, when Sterling Sound offloaded most of their lathes in the 70s and, and 80s they had two two lathes in each room because yeah. they were cranking out so many. And then, you know, as CDs came in, they had to they didn't need it anymore, sure. so they offloaded yep. them. Yep. Al Al bought I think seven or eight of the Sterling lathes, oh. um, and uh, you know, smart man because he saw he saw the future like I saw the future. It's well, he's, come back. he was a lathe dude. It didn't yeah. matter whether it was the future or not. <laughs> that was him. That's what he did. <laughs> That's what he did. Um, so I spent about um, ten years with with Al working on lathes, fixing, you know, learning about them, fixing them, um, oh. you know, and. It, whatever, helping him. You know, he was getting up there in the years yeah. at that point, so he needed a little help. The shop was in New Jersey. We'd drive down to New Brunswick every weekend and have a lay of fun. I liked that 62 Special. I was having fun cutting on it, but I really needed um, an, a better automation, you know, yeah. um, to be able to cut longer sides. I made a deal with Al, and I got this lathe, and he and I gave him the sixty, the sixty-two special, right. and it went to Korea for somebody to play right. I like the on. name of it, sixty-two special. There's something about that name. That yeah. I'm like. um, the sixty-two special was basically the same as the AM one thirty-two B, except it had a LPI meter on the on the pitch box instead of just a knob. Now, how are these these heads are difficult to fix, or they're um, there, there's really only one person who's doing reliable. Oh, that's um, nice. <laughs> um, that's head nice fixing stuff. these days, and he's in uh, Italy. Um, <laughs> this head came with my, with my '62 special, and I've been using it for twenty something years. I've never blown it. I've never had a problem with it. Uh, well, that's you know, good. and getting, I have a spare, but yeah. I've never needed to and use it. And getting the cutting styluses is not difficult. No, not difficult. Oh, that's um, how long can you? How, how many records can you cut before you got to replace it? Well, actually, the the new lacquers or the MDC lacquers, which everybody has to use from now, Japan, yeah, from yeah, Japan, yeah. and the stylus are fantastic. I'm getting quieter cuts than I've ever gotten, and oh, the styli last forever. That's They're, great. I'm really, really happy with Good. them. They're great. Um, really happy with them. All right. Um, so. Anything else you want to show me as long as I'm here? Because, the, like, that room looks really, that room looks, I like I like the look of that room. I don't know why. Um, it's, it's really... uh, sure. You want to see the, you want to see sure, the shop? I like the shop. I think yeah. the shop, it's just, something about it, I like. Um, well, the, that. you know, the shop was built for, um, was for building the console. You know, the, the, ha a lot. Probably half the money in the console is in the shop. Yeah. Um, you know, I probably have three or four thousand dollars worth of screws. So, with all the knowledge that you have about this, do, do other people come to you for lathe problems and questions? Cause you, yeah. seem, you seem to be a guy that knows a lot of stuff about this. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I'm a pretty competent lathe technician. Obviously. I'm not the, the most competent lathe technician, but pretty competent. Um, How many are there at this point? Mm, I, I guess know. Barry Wolfson. It, it's well, Bar Barry's good. I mean, Chris Muth is probably the yeah. best. Yeah. Um, but um, oh, you know what? This is you might. I have the Gotham. I inherited the Gotham Audio Library, so I have oh. every the every drawing that that Neumann ever issued for e any lathe. Wow, that's that's a great. Yeah. So people come to me and ask great for resource and ask for. Um, <clears throat> schematics and things like that. I have a ton of old, um, I have a ton of old stuff. Like, I posted a lot of this stuff on Instagram, but these are, these are um, 
old, you know, brochures, all the old um, Gotham audio oh, brochures. I love, I love old paper. So, you know, this is pretty cool stuff. Yep. Um, all the way up to, you know, the, all the way up to uh, DMM, you know, tel yep. tel deck, all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's pretty cool stuff. Fantastic. Um, and uh, there's al also some stuff that. Um, so where's, it's your, not really... where's your lacquer stash? Is that in some hidden hidden? No, it's right there in those boxes. Oh yeah, right there. Um, but uh, this might it's not really pro audio, but might be interested to you. This is the EMT thing, um, and uh, these are. Um, oh. Yeah, I know the guy that bought all of the cartridge manufacturing. Um, He's in I have Switzerland. these are. Oh, oh maybe uh, is this the. Oh yeah, I think it's this one. That has the rest of them. Yeah. So, so I have all these old um, original schematic drawings for all the broadcast room tables. Oh, um, cool. Oh, I know people that would love to see. You. Well, they're seeing it now. So yeah. It's happening. Um, so. Yeah, I have all this stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, it's not really my no, but my part, area of expertise, but I love old that. paper, yeah, yeah, and I love yeah. all this, you know, awesome. all the, um, they're, you know, nice big uh, a size drawings of, yep. you know, of, of all the, of all this stuff. Um, that's so cool. That's pretty cool. Fantastic. Okay, I think we've, we've covered, we've covered it and taken enough of your time. Okay. And gotten the picture pretty good. And so I'm just going to take a couple of still shots now. All right. And, uh, and I thank you very much.